So uh, this talk is about uh, diagnostic reports in Node.js. It's going to cover some of the material that Garish covered yesterday. Um, but uh, it's also going to talk a little bit about, um, well, I'm going to talk about, give you an introduction, say a few things that you can do with diagnostic reports, how to use them, basics. And then I'm going to talk about some tooling I built um, to help you use them. So uh, my name is Chris Hiller. Uh, I come from Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm known as Bone Skull on the internet. Um, so uh, I work for IBM, um, uh, primarily working on Node.js, uh, it's related things. Uh, I'm a maintainer of Mocha, which is a testing framework. Um, also involved uh, as a maintainer of Mocha in the OpenJS Foundation Cross Project Council. And I am Bone Skull on GitHub and on Twitter. If you have nothing better to do, you can look at my tweets, and that's Bone Skull with a zero. So I want to start with, with kind of some uh, hypothetical problems. So you have a hypothetical problem. Your process crashed. So what happens when a process crashes? Uh, if you're lucky, you're going to get a stack trace somewhere, uh, unless things went really south. Um, but so you might get a stack trace, and you've been you're a developer, and you've been tasked with investigating the stack trace and trying to figure out what's going on. So remember, this is a this is a dead process. Maybe your stack trace is in your logs, and so you look at the stack trace, and it says, "Oh, well, you're doing something weird," and the, the stack trace points to to this code where you're you're saying like rimder, and you want to delete a temp directory or something. Um, and you pass this flag, and so the error that you get looks like this. So error, E not empty, directory not empty, render, yada, 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 E not empty. So, okay, why would this fail? Some of you may have an idea. So you're, you're passing the correct flag, you know, your meticulous integration tests pass, works in your machine, works in CI, builds green, but this happens. So one way uh, to help you figure out this problem is to use a diagnostic report. And can you even see that? Anyway, it says use a diagnostic report. Um, and so let me describe the diagnostic report. And this is the gist. Uh, it's a experimental module, some functionality added. Uh, it's in node 12, so this is in LTS. You can use it. But it is an experimental API. So that means it's behind a flag. You need to pass a flag to use it. Uh, experimental, uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar, um, in the node sense, that, that essentially means um, the API or the, the behavior could break outside of the normal major release cadence. So if you do start using them, please be aware that they could break. Um, that being said, uh, they do their job very well. Um, but that, that API might change, the output might change slightly you know, before we hit the next, uh, next major. Uh, so essentially what, what this is, is it, it's a huge JSON dump reflecting the state of the process. Um, uh, most of, I seen, uh, uh, of them I've seen work out to be about 20, 25K. Um, you can trigger it several different ways, including you can give it some command line flags, you can trigger it programmatically, you can even tell it to um, dump uh, a, a diagnostic report uh, when you receive a user signal. So. Um, how do we want to create a port in this case, where we've got this process that's crashed? So we're going we're gonna to start up that process again, except we're going to give it these flags. So um, experimental report, you need that to do any of this stuff right now. You're going to say report, uncut exception, and then um, give it a nice file name. Um, you don't need to pass the, the file name, um, but in our case, that will be helpful. But um, normally, it'll create this very long file name based on the timestamp. So you run this in, in, uh, in your production, and, and, and time, time passes, and now you have another problem. So now you have a diagnostic report, and it, and it crashed, and, and now you have a lot of JSON. And so it looks kind of like this, where it's just like this blob. And you know we can kind of zoom in and maybe take a closer look. So um, it, it contains a whole lot of stuff. And I'm going to try to run through this pretty quick. But um, so there's nine 
or eight, depending, nine top-level properties. Um, and the first one is going to be header, and that's going to talk all about the, uh, the report itself, um, information about the node process, uh, the command line, you can see, um, the version, uh, the versions of the, in the libraries that node uses, um, uh, operating system, version, uh, CPUs, uh, all sorts of stuff. So uh, that's going to be in the header. Uh, the next one, if we, we will scroll down, and this is in order. So the next one you're going to see is JavaScript stack, and it's going to, of course, give you the stack. Um, uh, in this case, it, it crashed on an error. Um, next, you'll get the native stack, which is, which is pretty far under the hood, and you may or may not need that, but it's there anyway. The next will be information about the heap. Um, so this is your, uh, your memory usage. Um, resource usage will be your CPU usage. A um, little bit about file system activity. Uh, next is this libuv. Might need a better name, but it's, it's essentially the, the state of the event loop. What's in that event loop right now? Um, and so this is, it, you know, it gets a little technical, but there's stuff in this, this particular event loop. And over there, uh, environment variables, this has been trimmed, um, but it's everything in your environment. Uh, Windows users will not get this. So user limits, um, if you're a user on a Linux system, you'll have like limits of what you can consume. Um, shared objects will be the, the shared libraries that that node has is using. And so what we are concerned with, like what can help us solve the problem we have? Well, it would be here in the header. So we look in this header and we see we want to focus on this, the Node.js version. So the problem here is uh, RimRAF with that recursive flag didn't land until 12.10. So your node version is too old, but a, a stack trace wouldn't tell you that. So, great. Hey, you found the problem, good job. So you take this and you, you want to say, oh, look, this is, this is the problem, everybody. And as you go into Slack and you take this big report and you paste it in there. And now you have another problem. And um, what you did was you just leaked the entire environment. Like, in the Slack or, or wherever you sent it. Maybe you sent it through email. Uh, hopefully you didn't put it on pastebin. But um, yeah, there could be your, your, your AWS stuff in there. Who knows? So uh, your team lead is pissed. And so that's, that's kind of what we need to avoid. So, so how are we gonna, what are we going to do about this? Um, if you want to send one of these report files around, you need to make sure they're kind of scrubbed of things that shouldn't get out. Um, and so what you do is you go back and you, you delete your Slack message and you go and you open the report and you, you, um, you delete the secrets and then figure out how to exit Vim. And then, of course, this is all very tedious. Um, so uh, there is a, a tool that I was working on and, and it's out um, now, but it's called Report Toolkit and it's a tool for processing and analyzing diagnostic reports. Um, it's kind of a multi-tool, so it does several different things. It's not Unixy, you know. Um, uh, you know how multi-tools kind of suck to do any of those? Well, anyway, so th they don't do any one thing great, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So this thing is going, th this does some cool stuff. Um, it gives you a, a CLI tool to, to consume these things, and there's programmable API. You can check out the uh, docs, which are incredible. And um, there's the repo up there. So uh, what, what can we do? So we can use report toolkit and give it this redact command and um, pass it the, the report.json file or foo.json or whatever I called it. And what this command will do was, is it will look for things that it knows are potentially naughty and need to be kept secret. And it's based on the blacklist that AWS's get secrets project use. You may be familiar with that. Um, but you can kind of customize it to your needs. Um, so what it will do is it'll, it'll rep replace all of those terrible secrets in that report file with um, this string. And so it'll, and it'll override the file in place. So, you know, no, nobody's the wiser, right? 
And so now you can, you can safely pass this report around. Share it with your colleagues, you know, discuss it over dinner. But um, so time passes and you get, you, you have another problem. So you have this, this process, and may, maybe it's even a test or something, but you have this process and it's running. But, it, but you thought it should have stopped. So it's not a, a zombie process, but I'm just going to call it a zombie process. So you don't know why. And this is, this is weird because, so you got this process and you don't know why. And so you, you open up your debugger and no, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. So it's not hitting lines of code. You know, you set breakpoints, whatever. So you don't know why. Um, one thing you can do, this is something that report, uh, diagnostic reports can help you with. So um, you can actually generate a diagnostic report on demand. The, the process doesn't have to crash for you to get a diagnostic report. Um, and so I know we love command line flags, and so we can send report on signal. And so um, by default, what this will do is the process will respond to the user2 signal, and uh, that, that's configurable, but it but so you'll start, start your process and you can um, do this sort of thing and um, with the, the process ID. And so that sends the user to signal. And when the process receives that signal, it will say, ah, it's time for me to create a diagnostic report. And so it'll dump a diagnostic report out. So you look at this diagnostic report and then uh, I'm going to cheat because I know where to look here. So I would look in this libuv property, and I would go down and look. Oh, look! There's this timer, and so this timer, and um, it's active. So it's so it's in the event loop and it's referenced. So okay, it's, so it's still in, hasn't been garbage collected. Fires an MS from now, 999, that's a while, right? And so you can see that um, using this, you can get a clue. Ah, so I must have created some set timeout or some interval or something. And, you know, I was off by several orders of magnitude, you know, who knows? Um, but that'll give you a clue to try to figure out, oh, this is, this is one of the, this is where a problem could be. So um, report toolkit, if you aren't, if you don't know where to look. So it can do this sort of thing for you. And so it has this inspect subcommand. And this is, this is the thing that I think is really neat. So um, there are these rules, uh, they're heuristics. They're um, just an alg algorithms of functions that, that accept a, a report uh, file and you can examine, the function examines the report file and it decides what to do. And so the, the, there are, built-in rules, one of these um, happens to be the long timeout rule, um, which will look for this very situation in your report file. And so you could run this on your report file, or any report file really, and it'll look and it'll see, is there anything fishy going on here? Uh, so one of those rules is the long timeout one where it will, it will let you know um, if there's a, a, a timeout that's that's far off in the future and it's still active. Um, and so you could, you know, write your own rules to this. It's like a, you know, a plugin system. And so you could, you could write your own. Um, it, it works similarly, uh, similar, I can't even say that word, but that's how it works. It works like ESLint would. Um, and so you can write your own rules, publish to ESM. You could have it talk to the blockchain. I'm not sure why you do that, but you could do that. Um, and so this is what the output would look like. Um, so pretty simple. So it's just like this kind of tabular thing where it says, oh, there's an error severity issue in this report file and the rule that was triggered is this one. And the, then there's this thing with this bad expiration date um, or time. Um, and so that's, that's one of the rules. There's, there's others that will look and make sure that your you know, memory usage is within an expected range. Uh, your CPU usage is within an expected range. Uh, there's another one that actually will examine your shared uh, um, shared libraries versus the libraries that Node was built built with, and if there's a mismatch there, and so that's not going to you know be something that most people can be concerned about. But if you're compiling Node, um, that might come up. 
uh, where you say have a different version of OpenSSL than Node expects. So another problem you might have. So you got this flaky process, and the flaky process, you know, it's running and you're not sure why, it just kind of, it fails once in a while. Um, you know, maybe it fails on one machine but not the other and you can't really tell what the difference is. Um, so one thing um, that Report Toolkit can help us here is it uh, provides a diff subcommand. And so it's, um, you know, you could take a, a, a report a.json and report b.json, give it to your favorite diffing tool, um, but that's for diffing source code or, or text files. It's, it's not for diffing these report files. The neat thing about when we know the data we have, we can create a custom, uh, a purpose-built diff tool for this. And so that's what this is. It, um, it tries to ignore stuff that it thinks you probably won't care about. And so it tries to kind of, you know, signal to noise ratio, it tries to, to make it nicer for you to, to look at two reports and say, oh, well, that's how they're different instead of this, you know, huge unified dump or side-by-side -side diff. And, and so it, it answers your process. How, how does this, if you run this again and again and again, you can, you can diff them all and say, how does the process change over time? Uh, maybe that's a single process. Uh, maybe that's a, a process on, on several different machines, um, but you can diff any two reports this way. And, and the diff output looks something like that. Um, it, it, in this case, we see that uh, you know, the command line flags are a little different. So with this first uh, report file, um, we, we actually um, uh, said dash e for, for eval, and so the, the command that was sent was actually, hey, just write a report. The other one, who knows? But um, it didn't have any command line uh, options. The, the first report was generated with 12.1. The second one was generated with 11.2. Um, and so it, this, is, this is an excerpt uh, of, of that diff. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the idea there. And um, you know, if you don't like the, the tabular kind of output, you can choose different formats. Maybe you want it in JSON or CSV or something. So um, another thing is maybe you got um, maybe you got processes that are crashing somewhere. Maybe you have a lot of them, um, and maybe you're like, mm, that's not not a big deal. Um, we can just restart them because it's Node, right? Um, but so you want to know how frequently certain exceptions are, are happening. And, and maybe this will help you prioritize bug fixes or who knows what. Um, but to be able to figure this out, how, how often does a particular exception happen, you need to be able to count them. Um, so how do you count an exception? Well, you need to somehow, um, you know, you could, you could take the whole exception and stuff it, who knows, but you could take a, what you can do here is you can take a hash of that exception um, and you can kind of, uh, know, there's, there's some customization that can happen here, but you can take a hash and um, actually uh, just kind of output this uh, a little, little bit of JSON with an SH1 here using Report Toolkit. Um, and of course, you can do that with a script. Report Toolkit will do it out of the box. It'll also convert uh, these diagnostic reports to CSV JSON. You can filter stuff. So if you only want a couple of those fields, give it a filter. Um, table, of course, is that kind of output you saw before. Uh, new line would be something like new line delimited JSON if you need that sort of thing, a numeric. Um, I kind of, that, this kind of experiment where you can uh, like use it in, in a shell context where you can actually pipe it to something and maybe generate, there's like these like neat little tools that'll generate like graphs in your console. Um, you could do that and just combine it with filter and only pick out you know, a certain, um, a certain field and, and keep running that over time. Redact, of course, is it's essentially the same thing as, as uh, the redact command. So, um, yeah, and you can combine these transforms. You write your own, publish them to NPN, use them. In, no, you can't do that. But, so this is what a something would look like. So you'd get this uh, stack hash and um, 
you can see there's an SHJ1 hash calculated for this. Uh, I think you, know, you need to be able to, to customize this a bit. Maybe if your exceptions have some user information in them and you want to get rid of that, um, you know, maybe there's some personal, personally identifiable information in there. Um, you should be able to, to pass it a, a like a reg, regular expression or just a, a function, um, and you know write your own and plug it into this thing, um, and it'll help you generate those stack uh, that that hash, and then you can give this to your logging tool or your metric system or what have you. Um, so I think that's about it, but. What we learned is what a diagnostic report is, uh, how to create them. Uh, it's not everywhere you can create them, but that's, that's a couple of them. Uh, you can also create them programmatically, um, which might be useful if you're trying to grab them in like a serverless environment. Um, how you can use them to solve certain problems. Uh, they're especially useful, of course, in post-mortem debugging, where you don't have the option of running a debugger because your process is stopped. So. Um, and of course, how Report Toolkit can help you work with diagnostic reports when they become tedious, or how it can help you uncover problems that you may not be aware of. And so if you want more information about diagnostic reports, uh, of course, it is in the lovely Node.js documentation. There's a tutorial written by uh, Garish who, who spoke about diagnostic reports yesterday, and also uh, he was the one who, who got this code into core. Um, but there's a tutorial there, uh, which links to, goes to developer.ibm.com. Um, you can also, and I apologize, this is not very legible, but the uh, documentation site for Report Toolkit is ibm.github.io forward slash report toolkit. Um, and I'll leave that up for a second, but um, it is an IBM project. I'm the only person working on it, but it is still an IBM project. And so, again, I am Christopher Hiller. You can call me Chris. Uh, I work for IBM. I like Node and Mocha and stuff. Look at my website and things. Um, so thank you, Montreal and Node.js Interactive. <laughs>